This lecture covers the first chapter of clear-sighted statistics, Introduction to Statistics. The goal of all lectures from clear-sighted statistics is to help you see. C is an acronym that stands for Select the right statistical technique. Execute that technique properly and explain your findings clearly and succinctly. This lecture has five objectives. The first objective is to explain the discipline of statistics and some common misconceptions about it. Two, we will describe what you need to do to succeed in an introductory statistics class. Three, we will trace the origins of the science of statistics. Four, we will discuss why the study of statistics should lead to a healthy skepticism as we distinguish skepticism from cynicism. Lastly, we will review why learning statistics is important for your future. What is statistics and what are statistics? The word statistics has two distinct meanings. As a singular noun, statistics is the discipline of analyzing data reporting the findings and making appropriate decisions based on the analysis. As a plural noun, statistics are data derived from samples. To repeat, the second meaning of statistics is data sourced from a sample. We typically symbolize these data with Latin letters. A sample is a subset of a population. We typically deal with data drawn from samples. In future lectures, we will discuss how samples should be drawn from populations. Parameters are data sourced from a population. We usually symbolize these data with Greek letters. A population is a complete set of objects or subjects of interest. Examples of populations include every person living in the United States, the entire student body of a school, or every item produced at a factory. Is statistics a branch of mathematics? This is an interesting question. The discipline of statistics is sometimes called mathematical statistics. John W. Tukey, the famous statistician who taught at Princeton University and worked at Bell Laboratories, addressed this question. For Tukey, statistics is not a branch of mathematics. Statistics is a science, in my opinion and is no more a branch of mathematics than are physics, chemistry, and economics. For if its methods fail the test of experience, not the test of logic, they are discarded. Unlike statistics, mathematics are derived from axioms. What is an axiom? An axiom is a postulate taken to be true. In mathematics, axioms are the starting point for future reasoning, arguments, and deductions. Axioms are not something that needs proof. Here are nine basic axioms. One, A plus B equals B plus A. Two, A plus B plus C equals A plus B plus C. Three, A plus zero equals zero. Four, a multiplied by B equals B multiplied by A. 5. A times B times C equals A times B times C. 6. A times 1 equals A. 7. If A is unequal to 0, then A times 1 over A equals 1. 8. A times B plus C equals A times B plus B times C. 9, 0 does not equal 1. Let's turn to the science of statistics. The science of statistics is composed of two branches, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics deals with collecting data, organizing data, summarizing data using measures of central location, variation, and place, and displaying the data with tables, charts, or graphs. Inferential statistics 
deals with using sample statistics to make inferences about unknown population parameters, testing hypotheses, determining whether different data are related, and making predictions. Descriptive statistics example one. Only 33.33% of community college students referred to remedial math complete the sequence. This means that only one in three students who need remedial math complete this requirement. Descriptive statistics example two. 45% of community college graduates earn more than $45,000 a year. This statistic describes the annual income of 45 out of 100 community college graduates. Inferential statistics deals with decisions, estimates, predictions, or generalizations about a population based on a sample. A population or universe is a collection of all possible individuals, objects, or measurements of interest. A sample is a portion or part of the population of interest. Inferential statistics relies on probability theory. Probability theory is covered in Chapter 7 of Clear-Sighted Statistics. Let's turn to statistics and empiricism. Empiricism is a theory of knowledge or epistemology that holds that all knowledge is derived from sense perception. Along with the rise of experimental science, empiricism rose in the 17th and 18th centuries. Statistics is based on evidence, data, derived from sense perception. Empirical knowledge is a posteriority from the later. It comes from experience or inductive reasoning. Logic and mathematics rely on a priori from the former or deductive reasoning. Empiricists claim that knowledge is not based on conjecture, abstractions, or appeals to authority. How to succeed in an introductory statistics class. First, an old Chinese proverb. Not hearing is not as good as hearing. Hearing is not as good as seeing. Seeing is not as good as knowing. Knowing is not as good as acting. True learning continues until it is put into action. Learning statistics requires effort on your part. To learn you must act, which means you must study. You must work out problems by yourself. Here's what you need to do. 1. Read your textbook carefully. 2. Put your learning into action. Solve problems. 3. Be careful to select the correct technique. 4. Execute that technique properly. 5. Triple check your answers. 6. Explain your findings clearly in the context of the problem. You will need the following math skills to succeed. You must be able to do basic arithmetic. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide positive and negative numbers. Work with decimals and percentages. And find square roots and exponents. All you need is basic math skills to conduct sophisticated statistical analysis. These math skills should have been acquired by 6th or 7th grade. What is statistical literacy? It is familiarity using statistical thinking to deal with problems containing data. Appreciating the role statistics plays in decision making by going through the process of collecting, displaying, and analyzing data. Being able to read data resources, data analyses, and summarize information critically. This concept of statistical literacy comes from a paper on statistics education for junior high school students in China. Let's turn to the rise of the science of statistics. Three factors led to the rise of statistics as a science. One, the development of probability theory in the 17th century. Two, the rise of the modern nation state. Three, increased interest in the scientific study of human behavior. In the 18th century, statistics was sometimes called political arithmetic 
because governments needed to analyze quantitative data on economic, political, and social trends for the security of the nation state. The origin of the word statistics, its etymology, is the state. In Latin, statisticum means of the state. In German, statistic means data relating to the state. And in Italian, statistica means statesman. The Belgian astronomer and proto-sociologist Adolf Coutelet exemplifies the rise of modern statistics. He was among the first to use statistics to study social phenomena. He called this discipline social physics. His research focused on what he called the average man. He was among the first to apply the bell curve to social matters. The bell curve is a symmetrical curve as shown by this chart. The bell or normal curve is the central topic of statistics and will be discussed in detail in future lectures. Auguste Comte, an early 20th century philosopher of science, actually used the term social physics before Coutelet. But Comte disagreed with Coutelet's method of collecting data. Eventually, Comte changed the name of the discipline to sociology. Florence Nightingale, the famous 19th century English nurse, social reformer, and statistician, wrote in her copy of Coutelet's book, Statistics is the most important science in the whole world, for upon it depends the practical application of every other science. There is a deep association with statistics and lies. As Mark Twain, the great American novelist and humorist, wrote in his autobiography, figures often beguile me, particularly when I have the arranging of them myself in which case the remark attributed to Disraeli would apply with justice and force. There are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Twain's comment was echoed by Richard von Mies, an Austrian-born statistician who taught at Harvard University. He wrote, May I quote a remark I once heard? There are three kinds of lies, white lies, which are justifiable, common lies, these have no justification, and statistics. Our meaning is similar when we say anything can be proven by figures or modifying a well-known quotation from Goethe with numbers, all men may content their charming system to defend. Von Mies adds, a great deal of meaningless and unfounded talk is presented to the public in the name of statistics. My purpose is to show that, starting from statistical observations and applying to them a clear and precise concept of probability, it is possible to arrive at conclusions that are as reliable and truthful as those obtained in any other exact science. Charles Seif, an NYU professor of journalism, wrote a book on mathematical deception called Proofiness. Seif wrote, Proofiness is using numbers to prove what you know in your heart is true, even when you know it's not. Numbers have the particular ability to fool us. It's using that ability to turn nonsense into something that's believable with numbers. As the late professor Aaron Levinson of Baruch College cautioned us, statistics are like bikinis. What they reveal is suggestive, but what they conceal is vital. With characteristic wit, Mark Twain noted that statistics are often manipulated by people seeking to support an argument when he wrote, facts are stubborn things, but statistics are pliable. This is why we should remain a bit skeptical when dealing with statistical analysis. Statistics is often abused by both fools and knaves. Beware of fools. Fools misrepresent data because they do not know any better. Beware of knaves. Knaves misrepresent data to lie, cheat, and swindle. Let us now review the importance of skepticism and the risk of cynicism. A brief note about two schools of classical Greek philosophy, cynicism and skepticism. The ancient Greek philosopher Diogenes 
is the premier cynic in Greek philosophy. Cynicism is often associated with dogs because the word cynic is derived from the ancient Greek word for dog-like. Diogenes, who was prone to defecating in public, may have contributed to his philosophy being named after dogs. Diogenes is often depicted holding a lantern, saying that he needs it because he is searching for an honest man, which he felt did not exist. Here are some highlights about his philosophy. For Diogenes, society is incompatible with happiness. This is a radical departure from philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, who both claim that human happiness is only possible in society. Diogenes renounced wealth and physical comfort. He discarded all social conventions. He declared that there is no truth. People, he thought, are greedy and self-interested. Plutarch, the ancient Greek historian, told the story of Diogenes meeting Alexander the Great. The nature of Diogenes' cynicism can be seen in this famous meeting with the young Alexander the Great. Alexander met Diogenes just before he commanded his armies in the conquest of Persia. The meeting occurred after Alexander learned that the great Diogenes was nearby, living in a barrel by the river. Alexander decided to visit the elderly philosopher to see if he needed anything. Here's what happened. Alexander finds Diogenes sunbathing. Addressing the philosopher, he asked, Is there anything I can do for you? Yes, said Diogenes. Stop blocking my sunlight. Alexander's entourage wanted to punish Diogenes, but Diogenes' behavior made Alexander laugh. As he walked away from the philosopher, Alexander said that if he were not Alexander, he would want to be Diogenes. In his dystopian novel 1984, George Orwell's protagonist, Wilson Smith, underscores the terrifying cynicism fostered by totalitarianism. Smith is a mid-level bureaucrat at the Ministry of Truth who is going through a major crisis. Orwell writes, he, Winston Smith, thought as he readjusted the Ministry of Plenty's figures, it is not even forgery. It is merely substitution of one piece of nonsense for another. Most of the material that you are dealing with had no connection to anything in the real world, not even the kind of connection that is connected with a direct lie. Statistics were just as much a fantasy as the original version, as in the rectified version. Pyro of Ellis is credited with being the first Greek skeptic. His philosophy is quite different from cynicism. Skeptics hold that truth is uncertain. To uncover the truth, skeptics say we must apply reason and critical thinking. In essence, skeptics doubt and then investigate. Kathy O'Neill, data scientist and author of Weapons of Math Destruction, is a contemporary skeptic. In On Being a Data Skeptic, Dr. O'Neill wrote, a skeptic is someone who maintains a consistently inquisitive attitude towards facts, opinions, or especially beliefs stated as facts. A skeptic asks questions when confronted with a claim that has been taken for granted. That's not to say a skeptic browbeats someone for their beliefs, but rather they set up reasonable experiments to test those beliefs. Statistics leads to skepticism, not cynicism. The skeptic starting point are the five W questions. Who? What? When? Where? And why? Skepticism is the hallmark of a scientific perspective. British statistician George E. P. Box noted the link between statistics and science when he wrote, the business of a statistician is to catalyze the scientific learning process. 
why learning statistics is important to your future. Who uses statistics? Virtually everybody. Government officials, marketers, marketing researchers, data scientists, financial analysts, quality control experts, insurance executives, social scientists, educators, politicians, pollsters, and healthcare professionals. Here are data from an old study on starting salaries and whether the people seeking a job in that field need statistics. The job titles are listed in alphabetical order. The salaries listed are probably much higher in today's job market. Let's see what happens when we order the jobs by starting salary. The three highest paid job titles require applicants to have statistics. The starting salary for a job that requires statistics pays $30,200 compared to $20,450 for the average job that does not require statistics. The difference is $8,750 represents a 61% increase for statistics jobs over non-statistics jobs. The message is clear. Learn statistics if you want to earn more money. Learning Microsoft Excel can also lead to big bucks. Except where otherwise noted. Clear-sided statistics is licensed under a Creative Commons license. You are free to share derivatives of this work for non-commercial purposes only. Please attribute this work to Edward Volchak. You can access clear-sided statistics for free along with its Excel and PowerPoint files on the CUNY Commons. The URL is https forward slash forward slash cuny dot manifold app dot org forward slash projects forward slash clear dash cited dash statistics.